This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, uh, so thanks very much for, um, for having me here today. Um, the problem with this paper for me is that it touches on um, various areas in which I'm no way a real expert at all. So um, uh, I want to put out a disclaimer right at the beginning that I'm not an expert on, on Brazilian history, um, neither am I a a business historian, you'll, you'll know about the former when you hear me try and pronounce any Brazilian names and places in the paper, so you have to excuse that um, in advance. Um, my own interest is in diplomatic history, and particularly that of Britain um, and the United States, um, and I've become interested over the last few years in, in the relationship and interactions between Britain and the US in Latin America, as, as Colin mentioned. I've focused on that relationship in World War II, um, and in the course of that that research uh, came across this case uh, of the electrification of, of Brazil's central railway. And what was interesting uh, about this for me was the way that it, it, it operated as a kind of case study that, that brought to the fore much broader issues, particularly about Britain's economic interests in Latin America as a whole um, at that time and, and their prospects uh, for, the, for the future. Um, so that's what brought me to the case. Uh, hopefully there'll be, be something of interest in it, in, in it for you as well today. Um, okay, so one of the lesser known campaigns fought by the British government during the Second World War was the attempt to secure the contract for the electrification of the Central Brazilian Railway for the Manchester-based firm Metropolitan Vickers, or Metrovic as they were, they were generally known. These efforts proved to be ultimately unsuccessful when in December 1944, the contract was awarded by the Brazilian government to an American firm, the Electrical Export Corporation. By this time, the contract had taken on much greater significance for the British government than the profits by a British firm to be gained by a British firm alone. Rather, the British government has sought to use this case to establish a broader principle with the United States that wartime conditions would not be exploited by either side to gain commercial advantage over the other in Latin America. Now, this self-denying ordinance, as the Foreign Office liked to call it, was sought in order to achieve a broader protection of British economic interests in Latin America for the post-war era. Now, given the subsequent dominance of Latin America economically and politically by the United States in the latter part of the 20th century, it's easy to forget that Britain retained substantial, a substantial presence in the region as late as the 1930s. In 1938, the, full last, the last full year before the outbreak of war in Europe, Britain was the principal investor of capital in the region's two largest economies, Brazil and Argentina. Similarly, Britain was the biggest single supplier of goods to Argentina and Uruguay and provided 10% of Brazil's total imports. Britain was also the leading customer for exports from Bolivia and retained large shares of the export market in countries such as Paraguay and Peru. And even as Britain's interest in Latin America diminished during the Second World War, there remained a conviction throughout Whitehall that it was both desirable and possible to reassert Britain's status in the region in the post-war era. It was in this context of protecting Britain's broader economic standing in Latin America that British officials used the case of a central Brazilian railway to try to gain assurances from the US government that the war would not be used to oust British interests from the broader region. The State Department was at first seemingly sympathetic to this request. However, the US enjoyed a dominant status in trade and investment throughout Latin America by the 1940s, which for both political and economic reasons, it was keen to expand in the post-war era. In Brazil, in particular, the US arrogated to itself a special role in assisting the country's industrialization during the war and sent large sums of money and personnel to aid this process. This commitment to Brazil's development amid the broader context of growing US hegemony in Latin America meant that the US government ultimately proved unwilling to restrain its commercial interests from gaining the contract for the electrification of Brazil's central railway. The failure of the British government to succeed in preventing this outcome thus represented a wider failure to secure British interests in Latin America during the Second World War, and in this way is representative of the long-term decline of British influence in the region and the ascent of the United States. Now, prior to the Second World War, rail was the primary means of travel within Brazil and at the center of the country's infrastructure, 
was the Central Brazilian Railway, or Central do Brasil as it was known locally. Initiated by the imperial government in 1855, the line was gradually expanded throughout the century that followed, and by the 1940s stretched over 1,500 kilometers from the interior states of Minas Gerais and Sao Paulo to Rio de Janeiro on the coast. Speaking in 1944, the director of the railway went so far in his estimation of the line's magnitude to claim that by virtue of the extent and position of its system, the Central is unquestionably the most important railway not only in Brazil, but also in South America. With the bulk of the railway's expansion throughout the country completed, the focus by the mid-20th century was on modernization of the line, specifically from steam to electric operation. Now, foreign economic interests had been invested in the Central Railway from its inception in the 19th century, with the original contract for the work being awarded to the British engineer Edward Price. Foreign capital was again looked to when it came to the electrification of the line. In 1908, the US firm General Electric sent a team of experts to Brazil to draw up plans for the project, but World War I interrupted the implement implementation of these proposals. Following the war, the US, gained, the US firm gained a new contract to carry out the work, but the funds supplied by US Bank for the scheme were diverted to other purposes and the contract was shelved. Now, interest in the electrification of the Central Railway was reignited with the ascendancy of Getulio Vargas to the presidency in 1930 as part of his broader efforts to industrialize Brazil. Uh, this picture behind me is uh, a, a painting depicting the, the Central Railway of, of Brazil um, from the 1920s, and I think it, it speaks, it's obviously before uh, Vargas, but it speaks to this sort of centrality of the railway and the sort of Brazilian uh, infrastructure and even identity and this focus on, on modernization uh, at, at that time. Um, and these efforts were part of Vargas's political program of so-called Brazilianization, a nationalist agenda aimed at modernizing the state. In the realm of foreign relations, Vargas took a pragmatic approach, which often entailed playing foreign powers off one another in an attempt to achieve trade and investment to the greatest benefit of Brazil. Thus, when the Brazilian authorities again called for tenders for the electrification project in 1932, General Electric was outbid by their British competitors, Metropolitan Vickers. During the negotiations over the contract that followed, Metrovic and the Brazilian authorities decided to divide the project into an initial section of 35 kilometers, stretching from Rio, uh, from Rio to Nova Agrasu, and a further section of 73 kilometers extending the line to Barra de Piera. From 1935 to 37, the British company successfully completed the electrification of the first section and looked toward the completion of the line. However, disagreements between Metrovic and the Brazilian authorities over the terms for completing the second section of the line delayed the conclusion of the project. In 1940, the Brazilian authorities therefore issued a new tender for contracts to complete the second section of the railway. Securing this contract took on significance beyond the sum total of its parts, as it was widely predicted that whichever company established the technical standards and specification for this section of the line would likely be guaranteed work on the remainder of the railway system and possibly the bulk of Brazil's railway infrastructure into the foreseeable future. So it was with these factors in mind that the British Foreign Office backed Metrovic's tender for the contract and urged the Treasury and Board of Trade to guarantee the necessary financial support and supplies for the project. The British ministries were originally forthcoming in this support. However, World War again it disrupted the electrification scheme, and in April 1941, the British government withdrew its backing for the enterprise due to a war-induced lack of raw materials and manpower. Now, the failure of a successful tender for the new contract meant Metrovic's option to complete the electrification of the line contained in the original contract remained valid. However, having lost the support of the British government to complete the work, the company was well aware of the vulnerability of their contract. More specifically, they were immediately alive to the danger posed by US competition. In order to try to stifle this competition, the British firm decided not to immediately inform the Brazilians of their inability to fulfill the contract during the war in the hope that supply conditions in the US would worsen, placing US companies in the same predicament as themselves. And while this achieved their objective in the short term, such tactics also left Metrovic open to criticism from within the US. In an article in Time magazine, uh, the author complained that the company's efforts to keep a US firm from gaining the contract 
had left the work on the railway unfinished indefinitely. The president of the Washington-based Export-Import Bank, Warren Lee Pearson, lent official voice to this criticism, deriding the British government for allowing such underhand tactics. These attacks on Metrovic and the British government were in fact part of a broader tide of criticism concerning, concerning British business practices in South America emanating from the US throughout the summer of 1941. The broad thrust of these criticisms concerned the Lend-Lease program whereby the US government supplied Britain with much needed war materials. Shortly after par the passing of the Lend-Lease Act by Congress on 11th of March 1941, US businessmen based in South America charged Britain with re-exporting materials received under Lend-Lease in order that British firms might compete with their US counterparts in the region. Now, British officials were well aware of the potential danger such criticism posed to the continuation of the aid program, with lend -Lease subject to annual renewal by Congress and maintenance of public support for the aid was a top priority. Now, mindful of this necessity, the British government took steps throughout the summer of 1941 to deflect the criticism being aimed at its commercial practices in South America. Unfortunately for Metrovic, their Brazilian venture was sacrificed as part of this effort. On the 3rd of July, the Foreign Office undercut the company's delaying tactics, and the British ambassador in Rio, Sir Geoffrey Knox, informed the Brazilian authorities directly of the government's inability to support the electrification scheme at the present time. Sir Felix Pohl, the chairman of Metrovic's parent company, lambasted the British government for callously abandoning its interests in South America, but British officials turned a deaf ear to his complaints for fear of inflaming further Anglophobe sentiment in the United States. Indeed, from April 1941, when the British government first withdrew its support for the project, government officials maintained a hostile attitude toward the company and its Brazilian venture. At best, the British government viewed the project as an unwanted diversion for more important business. At worst, they viewed it as a threat to Anglo-American unity at a time when the goodwill of the United States was an indispensable asset. Now, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent U.S. entry into the war fundamentally altered the atmosphere in which British diplomacy with the U.S. was conducted. The day after the U.S. became a fully-fledged belligerent, one of the British chiefs of staff suggested a more deferential tone be employed in a message to the U.S. Winston Churchill replied, Oh, well, that is the way we talked to her when we were wooing her. Now that she is in the harem, we talk to her quite differently. <laughs> It was in this context that the British government started to change its attitude toward both Metrovic and, in turn, the US government with regard to the Central Brazilian Railway. The more immediate instance for this change of heart were reports from Brazil that a US firm was attempting to take advantage of, of Britain's inability to complete the work to try to gain the contract for themselves. On 4th September 1942, the New York-based Electrical Export Corporation, a consortium composed of General Electric and Westinghouse <coughs> International, submitted a proposal to undertake the work previously contracted to Metrovic. By the end of November, a judging commission had given favorable consideration to the proposal, and negotiations between the Brazilian authorities and the US company were well underway. The chief fear of Henry Walter Foy, Metrovic's representative in Rio, was that the US firm would gain the contract on the pretense that it could carry it out during the war, only to postpone it for post-war completion. What the company therefore requested was that the Foreign Office ask the State Department to restrain U.S. industrial interests from intriguing after the contract for the duration of the war. The realization that Metrovic might permanently, permanently lose this important enterprise to their U.S. competitors prompted the British authorities to take a more sympathetic attitude toward the company and adopt a firmer stance towards the State Department. But in choosing, to a course, in, in choosing to adopt this course of action, the Foreign Office had much greater aspirations in mind than the Brazilian Railway alone. Sir Edward Mather Jackson, the official in charge of economic affairs in the South American Department of the Foreign Office, explained that the broader goal he hoped to achieve was an understanding with the United States authorities that US industries should not receive any encouragement from their government to take away business which we are prevented from undertaking because of the war. In this sense, the Foreign Office hoped to extract what it called a self-denying ordinance from the State Department that would protect, protect British commercial interests in Latin America generally for the post-war era. The British ambassador in Washington, Lord Halifax, consequently took the matter up with the USO authorities, inquiring both whether the Board of Economic Warfare would be able to release the necessary supplies for the work 
and whether the Export-Import Bank was trying to finance the project. On the first point, View noted the strategic value of the iron ore and man manganese uh, transported on the railway, but did not consider electrification of the line a war necessity. They, thought, they therefore thought it unlikely that any application for the project would gain approval at the present time. On the second point, it was denied that any loan from the Export-Import Bank had been guaranteed for the project, but it was confirmed that Warren Pearson had given verbal undertaking, undertakings that the bank would be willing to support the scheme in the future. Now, while this may have been a more sympathetic reply than British officials had expected, the US response focused narrowly on the specifics of the case in hand. The State Department was well aware of the broader question raised by British, the British request. Would it prevent a US company from taking a contract that would have been held by the British competitor had it not been for the war? The failure on their part to address this broader question reflected an unwillingness to take a firm position on this matter at this time. So having failed to establish a broader principle protecting British interests via protests to the US government reflecting, re relating to this specific case, the Foreign Office opted to approach the issue head-on at the highest level. In a meeting with Secretary of State Cordell Hull on 10th of July, 1943, Halifax requested explicitly that the US government agree to the principle that no advantage in world markets shall accrue to either country at the expense of the other by reason of sacrifice made in the, in the interest of the effective prosecution of the war. In the aid memoir handed to the State Department at this meeting, London directly linked this request for self-restraint for self to Britain's broader ambitions for the post-war era, expressing an awareness that the United States government regard the extension of post-war trade as the common objective. It went on to express the hope that Great Britain should participate in this expansion in markets generally, including those in Latin America. Denying that there was any intention on the part of the US to purge British interests from Latin America during the war, Hull pledged US agreement to the principle of protecting British interests in the region. The agreement on general policy provided the British government with a new framework within which subsequent efforts to protect Metrovic's interests in Brazil could take place. This remained a key objective for the Foreign Office, for although they had been successful in winning official support for a principle to protect British interests in Latin America, the outcome of the case that had first raised this issue would now act as a barometer to the extent to which the US government would abide by it in practice. The necessity to test the new Anglo-American agreement arose just days after its consummation. On the 13th of July, the Brazilian Foreign Minister, Oswaldo Arana, informed the new British ambassador in Rio, Sir Noel Charles, that negotiations between the British company uh, and the Brazilian authorities concerning the electrification of the second line, the second section of the railway, would have to be broken due to the need to proceed with the work without further delay. Charles expressed dismay on receiving this news, but nonetheless accepted the Brazilian decision, asking only that further work on the railway be reserved for the British company as compensation for losing out on the present phase. But while this may have been a suitable response when viewing the case solely through the prism of British interests in Brazil, it failed to take into account the significance the Brazilian enterprise had taken on in Britain's broader policy towards Latin America. From the perspective of the Foreign Office, to accept the loss of this contract to a US firm would constitute a failure to uphold the principle agreed with Washington more broadly. London therefore deemed Charles's acceptance of defeat premature and again opted to raise the case in Washington. The subsequent British protests to the State Department centered on the fact that the Bra Brazilians had justified breaking negotiations with Metrovic on the grounds that they needed to progress with the, um, with the work on the railway immediately. The clear implication of this was that the British company's chief competitor in the country, the Electrical Export Corporation, was in a position to embark on the scheme before the war's end. This appeared to contradict the appraisal of the supply situation given to the Foreign Office by the State Department earlier that year. London therefore requested that the State Department dispel any misapprehension in the Brazilian mines and again make clear to Rio beyond any shadow of doubt that the same supply conditions that afflict Britain also apply to the US. The State Department certainly understood the linkage between the individual case and the broader principle agreed between Halifax and Hull. As Emilio Caledo, Special Assistant to the Under Secretary of State put it, for the British, the case was all bound up with other long-range questions. 
It was perhaps with such considerations in mind that the Chief of the Division of Commercial, Commercial Policy and Agreements, Harry Hawkins, suggested that the State Department comply with the British request and make clear to the Brazilians that neither country will be likely to complete work on the railway sooner than the other. This advice was only followed to a degree, however, with Jefferson Caffrey, the US ambassador in Brazil, merely being authorized to clarify the situation, supply situation, if the Brazilians raise the matter. Barring this, any misapprehension concerning US industry's ability to complete the work on the Central Railway sooner than their British competitors would be allowed to remain. The failure on the part of the State Department to enforce the principle agreed by her on the ground in Brazil allowed negotiations between the Electrical Export Corporation and the Brazilian authorities to continue unabated. Consequently, the offer by the US company to carry out the electrification scheme had been accepted in principle by the end of 1943. Beyond drawing up a contract, the main hurdle that remained for the interested parties was to gain the backing of the US government to ensure the necessary supplies could be released for the project with a suitable priority rating. By the spring of 1944, conditions in the US had eased somewhat, and the agencies responsible for administering wartime supplies informed the State Department um, that the, at least some of the materials needed for the electrification project could probably be scheduled for production in the next few months. This situation put the State Department in a position where only active opposition would prevent the Electrical Export Corporation from gaining the contract. Such opposition solely in order to adhere to the agreement with Britain proved too much to ask. The State Department subsequently sought a means by which it could quietly aid the Electrical Export Corporation without openly appearing to contradict the pledge to the British. The solution arrived at was to solicit a statement from a high-ranking official in the Brazilian government testifying to the importance of the work. In this way, the State Department aimed to shift the burden of pressing ahead with the scheme onto the Brazilians and thereby deflect some of the anticipated criticism from the British. In June, the State Department's wish was granted when the Brazilian Minister for Transportation and Public Works publicly expressed his support for the project. However, the drive to secure the contract for the Electrical, Electrical Export Corporation was thrown off kilter at the last minute by an internal rivalry within the Brazilian government. Throughout the summer of 1944, it had slowly become clear to the State Department that the contract between the Electrical Export Corporation and the Brazilian authorities had not been fully cleared in Rio due to the refusal of the Brazilian finance minister, Arthur de Souza Costa, to support it. By this time, the State Department was fully committed to seeing the contract go to the US company and was not going to let its efforts be stalled by the internal conflicts of Brazilian politics. A representative of the Brazilian embassy in Washington was therefore summoned to the State Department on 11th of October 1944 to seek clarification of the status of the contract in Brazil. At this meeting, Dean Maynard Phelps, Associate Chief of the Division of Financial and Monetary Affairs in the State Department, made it perfectly clear that the US was quite willing to aid the Brazilian government in the electrification scheme, and in all likely, the application for the necessary materials would be successful. But this could not happen, stressed Phelps, while the State Department remained somewhat confused in regard to the attitude of the Brazilian government towards the contract. This message was relayed in Rio, and a few days later, the Brazilian Minister of Finance discounted his previous misgivings and expressed his full support for the contract with the Electrical Export Corporation. With all agencies now supporting the scheme, both in Brazil and the US, the contract was finally signed on 29th of December, 1944. So from the perspective of Brazil, the strategy of playing off the two great powers against one another to advance the industrialization of the country seemed to work very well in securing the electrifications of the, of the nation's principal rail system. Viewed from Washington, the outcome of the completion, competition for the contract was a success in further integrating US capital in the economic development of Brazil. For London, the loss of the contract was a much greater consequence than this single enterprise alone. From 1942 onwards, the British government associated this case with its broader efforts to maintain its economic interests throughout Latin America for the post-war era. In exposing the failure of the US to adhere to an agreement not to exploit the war to replace British interests with its own in Latin America, this case was indicative of the general failure of that effort. By the war's end, Britain supplied four, just 4% 4 of Latin America's imports and received 12% of its exports. US trade, on the other hand, was increasingly dominant. In 1945, the US supplied 58% of Latin America's imports and received 49% of its exports. 
British investment in Latin America had also entered a steep decline as U.S. capital became increasingly dominant and a wave of nationalization swept across the region. There was hope in the Foreign Office at the end of the war that this dire situation might only be temporary. Such, such <coughs> hopes, however, turned out to be ill-founded. By 1986, Britain's share of Latin American trade had declined to less than 2%. During the same period, the U.S. consolidated its economic supremacy in Latin America, while at the same time seeking to maintain political hegemony in the, in the region as part of its broader fight against the perceived threat of international communism. The loss of the contract for the electrification of the Central Brazilian Railway by a British firm was therefore indicative of the general retreat of British interests from Latin America, alongside the rising hegemony of the United States that characterized the fortunes of the two powers in the region throughout the 20th century. Thank you very much.